Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together in a unity that you've provided by means of faith, by grace. Father, thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, and your love and time. Father, thank you for revealing your heart to us. Thank you for creating us in your image and then sanctifying us in such a way that we could never sanctify ourselves, Father, to bring glory to you. Father, we pray for those that aren't with us this evening, that earnestly desire to be here but cannot be due to illness or what have you. We pray also for those that are still lost in this world, Father, that we might be given the opportunity to evangelize them. Father, we are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, his work on the cross to make an evening peaceful, evening like this one even a reality. May we never become familiar with such things. Father, we ask your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> Again, the deceitfulness of sin, part seven. I really did uh, enjoy Tuesday's message. Thank you, Scott. Um, I think all the good work we've been doing on the specific topic of judging was summarized by a single sentence from the pulpit up here on the board. This came out on Tuesday. When we judge wrongly, we are being deceived by sin. When we judge wrongly, we are being deceived by sin. It's a good way to summarize a lot of the good work that we've done over the last couple of weeks. It seems like the Spirit uh, kept bringing up the topic of judging uh, specifically uh, as it related even to the deceitfulness of sin. And that, uh, again, this is a good summary statement. When we judge wrongly, we are being deceived by sin. Food for thought. The Bible tells us about the very nature of sin itself. For starters, our sin nature takes pride in itself. Our sin nature takes pride in itself. When you think about something as fundamental or as tempting as judging wrongly, we know uh, immediately why we would judge wrongly, because we want to oppress others. <laughs> our sin nature doesn't just, you know, Tashuka, try to get us on our back. It tries to expose the soft underbelly of everyone. Anything that it can dominate, it's going to choose to attempt to dominate. And so uh, our sin nature takes that pride and it says one of the ways I can get you on your back is to judge you wrongly and, get, and convince you that I have every right to judge you wrongly and get you on your back so that I can dominate you. Um, why? Because the sin nature takes pride in itself and always wants to be elevated. So if it pushes you down, the inverse action, of course, is that you go up, right? And that's the nature of sin itself. As a result, we all have a little religion in us. Remember the result, the fruit of religion is the stratification of the flesh. Uh, look around, you can look at most I shouldn't say most, but a lot of, quote, Christian churches are religious. And uh, in their own way, they stratify. They um, make and they appeal to the human flesh. They say, if you come to our church, you should feel good about yourself. Matter of fact, you should feel even better about yourself than the people that go down the church down the street or that are some other religion. And that's the nature of religion. We all have a little religion in us because we all have a sin nature. So religion really is just institutionalized sin natures. And I use the word religion in a negative connotation because James uses it in the, in the positive as well. There is such a thing as a, a good religion, but there's only one. So typically we use religion in the negative connotation from this pulpit, but please note that the Bible talks about uh, there being a good religion as well. I was thinking about all of this and religion and what have you and how Jesus despised false religion because it fundamentally pivots on hypocrisy. He, there was a few things that you could just very easily, if you read all the red letters in your Bible, everything it says about Jesus, the things that he, was really, that he really took offense with actively, uh, false religion, hypocrisy. So 
Jesus despised false religion because it fundamentally pivots on hypocrisy. Think about it. It's impossible for those who institutionalize false religions to ever keep the law of their own religion. That's the interesting thing about the oppressive nature of the flesh. It can't even do what it proposes it can do. It's always striving, and that's why it's exhausted. That's why even the flesh exhausts itself and its own uh, religion, its own religious activities. It can't keep up with itself. and In the process, it tries to press others down. So it's impossible for those who institutionalize false religions, uh, the hypocrites, if you would, to ever keep the law of their own religion. And Jesus called people like this to the carpet all the time. For example, I'll give you the expanded translation up here on the board of Luke 11.46. Jesus answered, How terrible, for woe to you, you experts on the law. You make strict rules that are very hard for people to obey, burden people with burdens hard to carry. But you yourselves don't even try to follow those rules. Or... Lift a finger to ease the burden. In other words, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You press people down for the sake of pressing them down. Why? That's what religion, that's what we just talked about. That's the human flesh. Teshuka. It just wants others down so it can be elevated. It's all about stratification. And religion is just institutionalized. Uh, sin natures, if you would, or the, the nature of sin itself. How terrible for you, woe to you, you experts on the law, you make strict rules that are very hard for people to obey, burden people with burdens hard to carry, but you yourselves don't even try to follow those rules or lift a finger to ease the burden. Now, this is a very important point to remember about Jesus and how and who specifically he spent his time discrediting. If you look at the... Uh, what is actually included, remember, um, <clears throat> if we included all the miracles and all his activities and filled volumes, so says the Bible. Um, but if we look at what actually is inspired uh, in terms of being recorded in the Holy Bible, uh, we, we do well to think about who he spent his time discrediting. He obviously understood that people were sinners and that he'd be surrounded by sin always, um, but he didn't say, you know, you're a sinner and you did this and you did. Did you see him doing that? No, he didn't do that. He was surrounded by sinners. Imagine that. He's perfect. Everybody else is sinners. And he's walking um, the way he walked. And he only pointed to certain types and categories of people with a certain venom. So he obviously understood that people were sinners and that he'd be surrounded by sin always. But where he drew the line was when these same sinners decided to elevate themselves, approach even his unique position, proposing superiority when there was no cause for it. Proposing superiority when there was no cause for it. He had a real problem with that. A real problem with people that made a life of stratifying. Um, <clears throat> I would argue that <clears throat> that's America. Honestly, I mean, look, I mean, isn't that America? Isn't that, all, isn't that what everybody's trying to do in America? Beat their neighbor? Be prettier, be faster, be stronger, be richer, be better at this or better at that? As long as you're better than somebody else in some other way, you have a certain, quote, self-esteem. We know what the Spirit has to say about that self-esteem. It's garbage. But nonetheless, that's the American way to get ahead. Um, anyways, Jesus had a problem with all of this. As I've taught in the past, there's no such thing as being king of the hill if the hill is a pile of dung. There's no such thing as being king of that hill. I mean, big deal. So you're on top of somebody else, but you still smell like dung. You're still, a f you're still filthy. So what, you're on top of the filth? Go on a limb and say that's not really anything to be bragging about. But yet, that's what people bragged about. And to Jesus, he had a real problem with that. The topic of hypocrisy 
I mean, you know, because there's a real magnetism to it, it would suck in other people, um, prey on their flesh. The topic of hypocrisy is what we see time and again when we see the topic of judging coming up as of late in Holy Scripture. Go to uh, Matthew 7, 1. We looked at this on Tuesday, Matthew 7, verse 1. And as I was discussing with a couple of people over the week, um, because judging came up, this, this, these little snippets on judging have hit people really hard, really hard. And um, it's been very freeing, I think, for a lot of people, because what you realize is that a lot of the passages that people use to say, you know, don't judge me, don't ever judge, you'd never have a right to judge another soul, they're taking things way out of context. They're not actually reading the entire context where judging actually occurs, which is what everyone does when they try to make Scripture say something it's not supposed to. Matthew 7, 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. I mean, if I stop there, I could probably make a pretty big, you know, ball of wax out of that, right? See, right there, it says, do not judge. Um, fast forward, I'm not, I, we're not going to fast forward, but in, in, in a few short verses away, all that, if I took that stance, uh, I'm an idiot. Uh, I, I'll, I'll refer back to it in a moment. But you can see, if I just took that thing, do not judge so that you will not be judged. I guess I should never judge then. Well, let's read for context. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. All right, now we're getting to something. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Uh oh, here comes the hypocrisy, right? Now we're getting at the context of the passage. So no longer can we postulate that we should never judge. Jesus was actually narrowing this conversation, narrowing it. Saying, if you're going to judge, then you better judge rightly. If you're going to judge by some measure, some standard, then have the courage and the unction, or the unction, I guess, if you would, to stand in front of the mirror by that same measuring stick that you seem to be hitting everybody over the head with. Verse 4, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You what? Hypocrite. That's what Jesus had a problem with. Hypocritical judging. Never had a problem with someone looking in the mirror and go, oh. Never had a problem with doing that. Never had a problem with actually saying, looking at something even viable and saying, oh, well, yay. I mean, even a celebration, let's face it, even a celebration requires judging because you judged it good. Right? But nobody wants to talk about that because this world's so PC. Everybody wants to talk about judging in the negative connotation. But righteous judging goes, is, is, is a two-edged sword. It just says, here's the line of righteousness. If you fall on this side, we celebrate. If you fall on that side, mm. That's what it means to judge righteously. But it's been so twisted. Jesus said, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly... To take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, this is the foreshadowing I was talking about earlier. Okay, suppose I went, verse 1, go back to verse 1, right? So I'm an idiot. Well, that goes without saying, but suppose I'm like a super idiot tonight for the sake of illustration. <laughs> Do not judge so that you will not be judged. And I come up here and I say, see, you can never judge. Okay, now what's verse 6 say? Do not give what is holy to dogs. And do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn, your, turn and tear you to pieces. Okay, how do I know who the dogs and swines are? <clears throat> you know what I have to do? You ready? Here's a big one. I have to judge rightly. For me to be able to look, for him to say that to me, which he says to all of us, do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, what do we have to do? We have to make a judgment. We have to make a judgment call, correct? Ta-da! See how he is? All you have to do is read, what, six verses instead of one? But see, if I have an agenda, I just read one. If I'm honest, I read for context, and I arrive at my solution, I'm all set. Easy peasy, right? See how easy it is? Read for context always. 
Always, always, always. I'll give you a little thing that I do personally. It doesn't matter what tool you use. I have a little Bible tool. Search for scripture. If I know like a phrase or something, I can't remember where the, what, what uh, the verse is, you know, chapter and verse. I'll type it in my little search tool and my, the verse comes up. And sometimes I have the temptation, well, let me just cut and paste the verse over here in my notes and keep going. I don't do that anymore. I always expand. I take the verse, I go to the whole chapter, and I read the whole chapter. And then if the chapter makes sense for the point I'm making in my notes, then I'll include it. I may not even include the rest of the chapter. Maybe it is just a verse, but I want to make sure that what I'm saying about that verse holds true in context. I can come in here and make, I can pull, I, I can write endless stories that make no sense if I just pluck one verse or half a verse out of context. I could get the Bible to say anything I want it to say. People do it all the time. It's called manipulation. My job isn't to manipulate you. My job is to get you to see the truth because the truth is what sets you free. And that's the ultimate goal for all of us. Amen? All right, so see how easy it is? All you have to do is just read down to verse 6. You see, well, God said I can judge. I just got to judge rightly. Again, the, required, the requirement for verse 6 is that we judge righteously. To echo our opening principle this evening up here on the board, when we judge wrongly, we are being deceived by sin. As we've been learning from the Spirit, sin deceives us in myriad ways. And that's been the interesting conversation uh, from my perspective. One example that came up on Tuesday was this. And this was uh, something I think that had been trickling out from the pulpit from Sunday even through Tuesday and now this evening. Just keep trying, quote, you know, the world says stuff like this. Just keep trying new things and eventually you'll find the answers. I have relatives like this. I, I feel like running into a wall sometimes. They just keep trying new things. New jobs, new vehicles, new uh, relationships, new uh, vocations, new hobbies, all kinds of things. Just looking for some happiness in all the wrong places. And the world just keeps, you know, pouring out. I always think of the magazines, right? Magazine sales. How do magazines sell anything? It's because there's always something new. What is, what's on the cover? A new haircut, a new hairstyle. Oh, I've got to change my hairstyle. You know, new fingernails. You know, now you got to do one each color and the stars and stripes here and the boogeyman here and, I don't know, the Pokemon over here and a real booger here. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Jeez, you know. But if that was, I bet you I'd be willing to bet, if that was in style, there would be a small percentage of people that would do it because that's how ridiculous people are. Anyways. Just keep trying new things and eventually you'll find the answers. That's a lie. The truth is that Satan, the kingdom of darkness, and sin will concede that Jesus has many of the answers, just not all. Just not all. It only needs a little bit. You see, sin, one of the things we're learning about sin is that not only is it a liar, but it's very erosive. We like to compartmentalize sin and say, well, that was something I did and it was over and done with. We like to uh, make lists and say, at least I didn't do that. We like to do all these things so that we can control sin in these little, you know, convenient, bucketized ways. But what we learn is that sin lies, first of all, about that whole attempt to control it, because you can't control sin. And it's also very erosive. It's very erosive. Let me explain what the Spirit's trying to say here. If we are to personify Sin, the way the Bible often does, we might say it is rather patient even. So the warning is, do not be fooled. Do not, remember the, our title, our message title is the deceitfulness of sin. Emphasis has always been on the deceitfulness of sin. Do not be fooled. Do not believe that deceitfulness is anything less than an erosive process. You see, that's the real deceit when it comes to sin. It's not that it can get you to do something stupid one night. Somebody might go home tonight, I don't know, do something stupid, right? Something comes out of their mouth, they're like, oh, that was wrong. Whatever the problem is, they do something stupid, whatever. That's not what the Spirit's talking about. 
The Spirit's talking about something on the more of a strategic level. <laughs> Do not believe that the deceitfulness is anything less than an erosive process. It is very subtle and may depend upon years of baby steps towards evil in order to ultimately meet its goal. If we're to personify sin the way the Bible does, it's an enemy. And our enemies never sleep. And it's erosive. It can wear us down. Do you understand? That's why we take in the Word of God, so we can be rejuvenated. Because eventually it wears us down. And that's very good as far as sin is concerned. Because then when you're tired, you can be fooled in a lot of ways. I think that as soon as we lose sight of the fact that sin has a long-term strategy in our lives, not just short-term tactics like, you know, hey, you should do this or that, like right now. Does that happen? Yeah, it does. You know, you have some awful lust pattern in your soul, and you, you, know, you fall on your head, and, you know, you get up, and you're like, you confess it to God, this kind of thing, and you move on, this kind of thing. We cannot lose sight of the fact that sin has a long-term strategy in our lives, not just short-term tactics. As soon as we lose sight of that, we are subject to the wiles of sin and arrogance, supposing that everything is just fine. I'm going to give you an analogy. Forgive me if it's not a great one. Suppose you have 2020 vision, or better yet, 2015. That means you're even better than, quote, perfect. But 2020 means that you have perfect vision, for lack of a better term. Where a guy like me, because I don't have that, not anymore, can't distinguish between letters on a billboard until I'm just about on top of it. You can see it from a distance two to three times farther away and quite, quite clearly. So we're driving down Route 195 some night and we have a complete power outage and the moon is behind clouds. So it is literally pitch blackout. Here's the question. What does it matter if you have so-called, quote, perfect vision if you're in complete darkness? What does it matter if you have perfect vision if you're in complete darkness? Likewise, what does it matter if you're a capable believer in Christ but remain in darkness regarding some area of your life? You need the light to see. Again, what does it matter if you have perfect vision if you're in complete darkness? Likewise, what does it matter if you're a capable believer in Christ but remain in darkness regarding some area of your life? You need the light to see. And that's what Ephesians 5 is all about. We're going to get to a component of that in a moment. As believers, we all have the ability to see the truth when the light of the Word reveals it to us. Remember, the truth is the good, bad, or the ugly. We just want to know the truth of the situation. Is there a pothole in front of me? Is there a, you know, a, a rose bush in front of me? What's in front of me? Good, bad, I don't care. I just want to see it all as truth. And as believers, we do have the ability, but we have to have the light turned on. That would be this. We have to have the Word of God to help us discern, to judge rightly. Because there's, uh, there's a lot of misdirection, and there's a lot of lying in this world. There's a lot of darkness it's upon us, but light shines out of darkness. But you could have the light. You get the point. So we all have the ability to see. We all have 20-20 vision, but the lights have to be turned on. <clears throat> However, if we choose to remain in the dark because we refuse to take in the Word of God, then it doesn't matter how good our so-called spiritual vision is. We will be deceived. We will be deceived. If we choose to remain in the dark because we refuse to take in the Word of God, or maybe we even hear it and we ignore it, you know how that works. And I don't like this one. I don't like this lesson, Pastor. 
I don't like this one. This is way too shallow. I don't like this one. I'm going to la 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 in your head. Some of you right now are probably la la la. I don't know. <laughs> right? I don't like this, so I'm not listening. I'm going to tune you out. I'm going to start thinking about the old Richard Simmons workout videos. <laughs> Sorry about that. All I can think of is a silk striped shorts that were way too short. They would like the definition of short on some curly haired, effeminate person. <laughs> I shake that one out of my head. <clears throat> if, we <laughs> if we choose to remain in the dark because we refuse to take in the Word of God, then it doesn't matter how good our so called spiritual vision is. We will be deceived. It's not a matter of if, it's when. We will be deceived. It's that simple. Go to Ephesians 5, 6. <clears throat> That's why we have warning after warning after warning after warning in the Word of God to depend on the light. Why? Because the, the, the Satan, the devil, he's prowling about, looking for souls to devour even. Therefore, Ephesians 5, 6, we have something like this. Let no one deceive you. See, it's the deceitfulness of sin, right? Someone's sin nature, the manifestation of sin in another person even. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You want to know who has empty words? Uh, Neil, Neil Tyson Degrassi. Now his IQ, is, as far as I know, is, is significantly higher than mine. But his words are empty. But man, does he have a following. Woo wee Man, does he have a following. He is a charismatic teacher, very well spoken, extremely intelligent, and an outgoing atheist. So everything he says is a deception. Everything he says is meant to lead people away from the truth in Christ Jesus. To say, that's right, forget about the light. Remain in darkness with me. I'll be your guide. It's nothing but empty words. And what does the Bible say? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, which one is this guy, this Degrassi guy. He certainly is a son of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Do not be enamored. Just because these people are charismatic? I mean, who do you think Satan's going to elect? Who do you think Satan's going to use as mouthpieces? Why do you think, I mean, I would argue, I don't know this for sure, but probably a lot of them are in politics. Seriously. Why? Because they're the most well-spoken. I mean, how else do idiots, people with vapid, empty words, get elected into public office? How do thousands and thousands and millions of people vote for these people? Because they're the Pied Pipers of darkness, and they appeal to the darkness within people, within society itself. But what does the Bible say? Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is a light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. Why? Because the days are evil. Because the days are evil. Again, up here on the board, thwarting our own arrogance. What does it matter if you have so-called perfect vision if you're in complete darkness? Likewise, that was Paul's encouragement. Walk as children of light. Walk in the light. Walk by the Spirit. You see these phrases over and over in the New Testament. What does it matter if you have perfect vision if you're in complete darkness. Likewise, what does it matter if you're a capable believer in Christ but remain in darkness regarding some area of your life? 
You need the light to see. And that's all Ephesians 5 was encouraging us to see. You need the light. Don't partake. Go around like I was saying on Sunday. Don't go on that side of the road and flirt with danger. Stay away from it. That's the dark side of the road. This, the lamps are on this side of the road. You know, street lights, they're on this side of the road. Stay in the, the lit path. Don't go over there in the dark skulking around. That's where danger lies. That's where the serpent has trodden. You need the light to see, or else you will be deceived. Not if, you will be deceived. I love the visual we received on Tuesday regarding the old Indian woman clutching her Bible. It was from India, right? Yeah, the old Indian woman clutching her Bible. And this principle came out on have this attitude, the visual, have this attitude, have that attitude. You know, she just clutched her Bible. She knew that that was everything to her. Say, I need the Word of God to survive and not be taken captive by the enemy. I need it. That's what you have to say when you're tempted. Pick up your Bible. That's a, that's, a, that's a tactic I'm still learning, and I'm almost 50. Get tempted by the same old thing. And the and, and first thing the Spirit says to me is, pick up your Bible. I don't even care where you go right now. Just pick up your Bible and start reading. Anything is better. Anything that pushes out those unholy thoughts you're having. And you know what I do? Sometimes I do. <laughs> and you know what I do the other times? I don't. Because I'm weak. I wish I could lie. I wish I could tell you right now in front of all of you that I'm 100% perfect at that tactic, but I'm not. But I do know this. I do need the Word of God to survive and not be taken captive by the enemy. enemy. I've proven it to myself. Go to Philippians 3.13. It's a wonderful strategy. That's why you should have some kind of Bible app on your phone or your, your Kindle, definitely a computer. Maybe you have a, a small print Bible somewhere on your person, in your car, at all times. Because when temptation hits you hard, you can go to it. Just go to it and open up. Start reading anything. Seriously, anything. Philippians 3.13 Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. So this is Paul in a mature state saying, I, I, I still, am, I'm not arrived. I haven't arrived. I'm still clutching to truth with every fiber of my being. I know where my salvation is. I know where my deliverance is. I know how it happens. I know where, when it happens. It's when I cling to the truth. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you, will, will reveal that also to you. That's what I was just explaining in a very practical way. Hey, look at dummy. You're having a real bad temptation right now. I'm revealing it to you. You see, this isn't just words on page. This, act, this actually happens if you open up your heart. If you're open to God the Holy Spirit. He will actually say, hey, you're having a rough time. I can see it. I'm revealing it to you right now. Go read your Bible. Go do something different than what you're doing. Pick your butt up and go do something different. And stop flirting with that temptation. You know how we do it in our mind, right? We like juggle it. We like play with it like a cat, like a kitten with a piece of yarn. Right? It's like, oh, look at that. Right? You know what I'm saying? It's like, and then it's like, the next thing you know, you're, you're sitting. The yarn's all around you, and you know. It was fun to start with. You played with it. The Bible says don't even play with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's soft and pink and cuddly and fun looking, but it's dangerous. Have this attitude, and if anything, if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, 
that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Stay the hell away from them. Again, the point on the board, I need the word of God to survive and not be taken captive by the enemy. Speaking of captivity, the Bible speaks about, quote, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, which is a wonderful way for us to think about the things that we allow to occupy our minds. Again, the Bible speaks about taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, which is a wonderful way for us to think about the things that we allow to occupy our minds. Now that's something we have a real play in, right? We really do have a play. Like I think it was Scott was saying the other about TV. Did you mention TV on Tuesday night? Yeah, like stuff, something like TV or, you know, whatever it is that you allow in your mind. You do have some control over those things. You do make decisions about those things. I'm going to give you an analogy. If I jump out from behind a bush and scare you, Where is your mind in that moment? Seriously, if it's dark, say, out here, right, and I play a joke on you some night, and I jump out from behind a bush, where is your, and I'm right in your face, Where's your, where is your mind in that moment? Or what if I just position myself about a foot away from your face? Where is your mind in that moment? Or even if I'm 20 feet away from you and I'm yelling, Hey, over here, look at me. And I proceed to do the MC Hammer dance. I won't. For your entertainment. <laughs> Where is your mind in that moment? Those are three physical analogs to the spiritual. If you allow sin to place itself front and center in your life, your mind will be captivated by it. Fair enough. If you put something right here, you will be captivated by it, especially if it has the appeal of sin, something sinful. Your flesh is licking its chops. If you allow sin to place itself front and center in your life, your mind will be captivated by it. And to the degree it is clo close in proximity, to that degree you will be more or less captivated. Paul wrote about this. Go to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. Paul wrote about this. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 10, 3, for, we, for though we, Paul and his disciples, walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Excuse me. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Up here on the board, I'll give you a quote from MacArthur on this one. Every thought captive emphasizes the total destruction of the fortresses of human and satanic wisdom and the rescuing of those inside from the damning lies that have enslaved them. Again, Every thought captive emphasizes the total destruction of the fortresses of human and satanic wisdom and the rescuing of those inside from the damning lies that have enslaved them. Look at verse 6. And we are ready to punish all disobedience. Whenever your obedience is complete, you are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. 
As we noted, the Bible teaches us to hold every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Practically speaking, then, this means that we ought to seek instruction from the Word of God on life itself. We ought to seek instruction from the Word of God on life itself. What do we need? We need the light. That's what the Spirit's been saying all night this evening. We need the light. We need the light shined in our lives. We have to have the Word of God. That means if we're going to hold captive to the obedience of Christ, we have to seek instruction from the Word of God on life itself. That's the practical side of all this. And specifically, how to avoid the pitfalls that the very presence of sin in our lives represents. We can call this, you know, turning on the lights or whatever, but what really matters is that you take in the Word of God as often as you can. Go to Proverbs 4.13. Proverbs 4, verse 13. That's why I think, you know, many times, if you're ever stuck, you know, it's Christmas time, if you're going to buy someone something for Christmas, you can never lose with the Bible. You never really can lose with the Bible. I mean, it's really the greatest gift of all—the Word of God, right? I mean, really, I'm not saying everybody. I'm not saying everybody should buy Bibles, you know. I'm just saying that you can't really lose. It's a wonderful gift. Why? Look at Proverbs 4:13. Proverbs 4:13. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. I'm thinking of that Indian woman again. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked. And do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. That's the, if you, that, if that looks familiar at all, uh, A.W. Pink quoted it in his book. That was one of the quotes we put up here on the board recently. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. That was my whole dialogue about staying off that side of the street. Don't even go near the tree that bears fruit that is tempting for you. Go around it. Take the long road. Go around it. Just stay away from it. That's what the Bible tells us. Hold on to instruction. Leave that stuff over there. Stay on the light where the lights, the street lights are. Stay off the dark side. Just, I mean, I think how easy life would be if we just followed that counsel. If we just said, okay, I'm just going to make I'm just going to make a real decision right here and right now. I'm going to stay the heck off of that side of the road from here on out. I'm too old. <laughs> I just keep falling down every time I go over there. I'm just going to make a conscious decision. I mean, sometimes this is really what it takes. I'm just going to make a conscious decision. Maybe it's tonight for some of you. Make a conscious decision. I'm done. I'm done with living this life this lifestyle of depraved living, of horrible decisions. I'm going to start actually, here's an here's a epiphany, I'm going to actually start listening to God. <laughs> I'm actually going to start taking God's word over my own. I'm going to take God's opinion over my own. I'm actually going to start doing this. I'm going to start listening to to the Lord in His Spirit when, it con- when He convicts me and says, you know you're about ready to do something like really bad. When He says that, that's, when, that's the strategy. Maybe you, that's when you pull your little mini, your mini Bible out of your back pocket or you'll dial it up on your ridiculously expensive smartphone, right? And it's like... <laughs> that's when you do the little strategies. You take hold of instruction. Do not let go because that's what, the, that's what darkness tries to do. It tries to overcome you. It tries to squeeze the light back out of your life. Why? Because it's a lot easier to deceive somebody when they're in the dark. I mean, isn't that what governments do? Isn't that why they keep the citizens in, in, you know, as ignorant people? They don't want to educate the citizens because if the citizens knew better, they'd rise up 
and revolt. It's not. It's like the ages. I mean, it's what, right? House divided doesn't stand. Sound familiar? Abe Lincoln did not say that. Jesus did. Even though Abe Lincoln gets credit for it. Right? All that kind of stuff. This is all the spirit. This is like not rocket science. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. If you don't heed the good counsel that is coming from this pulpit right now, you are playing with fire. Something the Spirit's been alluding to all week. Go to Proverbs 6.20. Proverbs 6, verse 20. Love this passage. Proverbs 6.20. My son... Observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. As Scott said on Tuesday, you see the intimacy of you to the word of God. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they, the commandments, will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Oh, man, that's good wisdom. Maybe that's why they call them the wisdom books. Man, that's good wisdom. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and, re and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Paul wrote about the intrinsic value of the Word of God Years later, up here on the board, 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof. Think of Proverbs 6.23. We just read about that. For correction, for training in righteousness. Peter wrote about ignoring this good counsel when he said in 2 Peter 2.19, Part B, For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. By this he is enslaved. You spend your time in darkness, you are enslaved by it. To whatever degree you choose that route. On Tuesday, Scott mentioned addictions even as a more advanced stage of sinning. And this, for obvious reasons, is not a very popular thing to say up here on the board. The deceitfulness of sin Sin would love for you to rationalize any addiction as, you know, no big deal. No big deal. Uh, what's that? Hey, what was that t-shirt? Oh, my God, that was the funniest t-shirt I saw recently. Um, oh, I know. Craft beer. It's not alcoholism. It's a hobby. What, nobody thinks that's funny? Nobody? Uh, it's so funny, right? Come on, that's kind of funny, right? Honey, I only had one. Yeah, it's this tall, and it's triple the potency of a regular beer. You had three. <laughs> Why is nobody laughing? Is anybody here to drink craft beer or something? I drink them from time to time, too. There's no guilt, there's no condemnation. Settle down here. Sizzle chest. <laughs> My God, relax. These people, loosen up. Just a t-shirt. I didn't even make it. Just making a point. <laughs> Sin would love for you to rationalize any addiction. You know, as like no big deal. And I was thinking about this. No big deal. You know, like like we started class off with uh, where, you know, the kingdom of darkness will say, Oh yeah, Jesus, great teacher, lots and lots of wisdom. Didn't know everything, though. So in other words, what you're really saying is you always want a back door somehow. You just, you're not saying you want a front door entrance. You just want a door. You don't even care if you come out of the bowels, out of a manhole cover, as long as you have some access to the game, right? That's all you're saying, right? He's exactly what's being said. Wolf in sheep's clothing, Trojan horse. You can call it whatever you want. Looks the part. Look at the, the Judaizers back in the day, all righteous and, you know, clean. And, you know, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Dead on the inside. 
As long as they have like a, th- you know, not that big of a deal. Sin, would l- Sin loves that conversation. Think of the type of blogs that he's having me write lately. He loves, Satan wants you to have those kind of ridiculous conversations. It's not that big of a deal. So I was thinking about that. And it makes me think of the buzzword. Um, and I don't mean to affect anybody that's struggled with addictions, but there is a buzzword in addiction circles or even the therapy side of things called a gateway drug, right? There's things called gateway drugs, you know, smoking, or I think even uh, alcohol might be considered one. I don't know that much about it. I'm not going to propose I do. But I do know there's this idea of a gateway drug, a lesser drug that leads to a more potent type drug that might have really addicting properties like cocaine or heroin or something like that. But anyways, I got this off of Google. A habit-forming drug that, while not itself addictive, may lead to the use of other addictive drugs. So it's kind of like a, a, an erosive thing. Is that key word again? It's like a slow entree into someone's life, into manipulating, controlling someone's life. It's like a slow entree. See, it's not that bad. You know, it's not that bad. I mean, that's what the guy says a month before when he was just holding his hands. Now he's having sex on the couch. It wasn't that bad to hold him her hand. We're just friends. It's not that bad. Fast forward, it got bad, didn't it? This was the gateway drug. This is the end product. Because everything in between proves that you can't control sin. So what did Jesus say? Cut it out. Cut it out. (laughs) See, sin, there's a lot of gateway drug analogs when it comes to sin. And Satan's a genius. He says, if I throw this at them right now, they're going to say, there is no way in hell I'm ever going to do that sin. There are sins I've done in the last, I don't know, five, ten years. I said I would never in my life ever dream of doing, and I've done them. How did it start off? Gateway drug. Gateway sin. And then it just kind of like, you know, la, 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 la. Next thing you know, I'm an addict. You think Satan's dumb? You, you don't think he knows how to come right up through the bowels, you know what I'm saying? So let's draw an analogy. I've got, I'm almost out of time. Gateway drugs versus gateway sins. Fair assumption or fair analogy, fair comparison? I think so. Gateway drugs versus gateway sins. A 13-year-old boy runs into his best buddy while walking down the train tracks. His buddy says, hey, want to see a naked woman? And he pulls out a nudie magazine he lifted from his pops. The boy runs over and sees a nude woman for the first time, and, you know, something stirs in him. I mean, he is 13. Something sexual, but he doesn't know how to place it. Is the boy instantaneously addicted to pornographic material? No. No. However, a nudie magazine might be a, let's call it a gateway sin, for a future life of addiction to pornography. Maybe that's how it starts. The kid's only 13 and doesn't even know how to place that thing yet. There's already a seed there. I remember watching a movie when I was back in college and I happened to be sitting next to a mother and her 10-year-old daughter. Now, it's me and a 10-year-old who's eating, like, cotton candy or something. And I'm like, hey, cute kid. I hope there's nothing really bad. It was like a, you know, semi-benign movie. I'm like, I'd probably be good, you know. And then the mother. I'm like, whatever. And right in the middle of the movie was an explicit sex scene. I'm like, I'm, like, embarrassed. I'm like totally embarrassed. There's a little girl next to me, okay? And there's an explicit, you know, 100-foot sex scene right in front of us. I'm like, you know, my expectation was that the mother was going to be like, you know, slam her hand over the girl's eyes and like tuck her under her coat and run her out of there. I look over, the mother's like this. 
I'm like, what the hell's going on? She sat there eating popcorn like nothing was going on. I mean, what's going through this, this person's head, this mother's head? Was it possibly? I don't, I'm not judging. I'm not saying I know what was going on. You know, ah, she's so young, she won't even understand what they're doing. It's all, it's okay. Cause, you know, because I really want to watch the movie is what she's saying. I'll risk my daughter's uh, future because I really want to see this movie. I can only speculate. But statistics have shown that children that have been exposed to sexual things early in their lives are more likely to be sexually active earlier. Even more likely to become sex addicts. I know. This is the insidiousness of gateway sinning. You see? It's like we started off with this evening. It's not about hitting you up front. It's eroding. It's slow. Let's plant a little seed here. Plant a little visual there. Plant a, uh, an idea over here. You know, have it reaffirmed by my ridiculously awful parents over here. Um, have the school system reaffirm it over here. Um, you know, have my whatever, the playground, wherever these kids are getting exposed. You know what you are? You're a child too. You're a child of God. And you may be repulsed at what you just thought about, but think about what we're exposed to in this world. Think about spiritual adultery. You might say, I would never be an adulterer. Like Scott said, you're all adulterers. Everybody's even looked at somebody sideways as an adulterer, according to Jesus. But you might say, I would never do that thing. Really? You adulterate all the time. Just saying. You see, we're all children. And so that's the, that's the analog to what I just described. And there's all kinds of, quote, gateway sins that just kind of just, you know, get planted along the way, and it's insidious. As long as it has some way to get through, some way to discount the light, some way that um, sidesteps or pushes aside truth in the Word of God, some way that discredits the pastor who's trying to save his sheep a lot of trouble by, by teaching you know, difficult lessons, about like holding hands on the couch, that type of thing. Never a popular thing. Obviously, the, uh, the beer one was not popular either. <laughs> Jot that down. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, the, that's what darkness does. It discredits. It deceives. It says, ah, it's not that big of a deal. But it is. It really is. That's the point. And that's what the Spirit's trying to say. You might have a list and say, I never killed anybody, I never did this, I never stole, I never did... Right? Yeah, you haven't done any of those things yet, but the, the seeds have already been planted. The seeds are already there because you're not listening to what the Spirit's saying. You haven't been. The Spirit's saying, do not get caught even with the gateway sins. You know what I'm saying? Okay, you didn't, go on, you didn't go on that side of the street and go into the brothel. But you stood there and looked at the sign and saw the little, you know, the neon dancing girl that goes like this. <laughs> right? <laughs> that thing. And you're like, whoo, yeah, I wonder what's inside. You know what I'm saying? You didn't go in, but now you got this going on in your head, right? And you're like, next time you're like, well, I already saw that. I got to step this game up a little bit. I'm bored with this now. I got to go in. I'm just going to go talk to the bouncer. I'm not going in. I won't go in. I'm just going to talk to the bouncer. Hey, Chucky. Hey, did we go to school together? Dude, you can get, I'll let you in for free. Come on. That's gateway sinning. The Spirit's basically saying, stop. Stop playing the game. Stop acting like it's not what it is. A sin, you ready? Is a sin, is a sin. Sin is a sin is a sin. So back to this poor little girl. I can't imagine this little girl made a habit of going to see explicit movies. So we can't say that she's addicted. 
However, the seed of evil had been planted. And like many things that are supposedly, quote, harmless as long as they aren't habitual, evil seeds have a tendency to grow roots and bear fruit. Eventually, if not, cut out, as Jesus would say. And I'll leave you with this familiar principle from the past lessons so far on the deceitfulness of sin. You are incapable of controlling sin on your own. Sin wants to deceive you of this very truth. It wants you to think that you actually can control it so that you don't have to cut it out. That's not that bad. Honey! It's not that bad. But you have it, you can't, and you never will. You cannot control sin. God can. Light can. God the Holy Spirit has the power to do it with the light, but you can't. You can't. So we'll end here. Matthew 18, 9. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for always being so upfront and honest with us, even though sometimes it stings. Father, we know that you love us. The world doesn't love us. It despises you. We are mere pawns, Father. This we know. This you and your word tell us, Father. Thank you for teaching us the truth, and thank you for giving us the faculties to be able to see it all as truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, even when we look in the mirror. Father, we just ask for your guidance as we take these things out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs them so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.